All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the first uh, webinar and first podcast of 2024. Can you guys believe we're already in a new year? Um, we're grateful to have Tyler Dolly here with us. And um, welcome, Tyler. We, uh, we're glad to have you here. Um, Tyler reached out to us a little while ago and he said, you know, I'm a, um, I produce birds and I see you produce beef. Let's see if we can work together. And so he sent us some of, um, some of his product and I tell you, it was really good. And, uh, I, I appreciate somebody who is willing to reach out, um, willing to collaborate. And so our team reached out to Tyler because he's definitely a regenerative agriculturalist. He's a steward of the land. And um, we look forward to hearing from him. We can keep this interactive. I know he's got some notes and things prepared, and so we'll kind of let him run with that. And as always, those of that are that are here live, you can um, interject your comments either in the chat box or just raise your virtual hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask your comment. We can have it more be be more of a dialogue also. So so Tyler, just kind of introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us where you're from and uh, what got you started in this regenerative agriculture. So yeah, my name is Tyler Dolly. We're from Big Bluff Ranch. Um, we're actually in Red Bluff, California. So we're about two hours north of Sacramento, four hours north of the Bay Area in the uh, Sacramento Valley. So we're a Mediterranean climate. So we've got um, all of our winters happening right now. But when I say winter, this is this is California winter. I, I wear a sweatshirt and a thermal and like that's about all I need. So I'm not, you know, when people talk about snow drifts, I'm like, what's snow? I don't get snow. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're located and what we do. Well, that's a big ball of craziness that, um, kind of, kind of go, got to go back to 1960 to get you situated to who we are. Um, my grandfather bought this ranch in 1960 and at the time, he was an industrialist. He was writing the post-World War II building boom, and he was actually building scaffolding, portable scaffolding for sheet rocks and painters and those sorts of guys to go and uh, build all the houses and whatever. And so he ended up having a plant in the Bay Area, then he had a plant in Scotland for a while. So he was kind of a high flyer jet setter. And... <laughs> Apparently, he'd always wanted to be a rancher. He grew up in Vermont, not ranching, but on a small kind of homestead type thing. Mostly grew up in California, though. And he's apparently told Graham all the time, like, oh, you know, I really think I could be a rancher. I want to be a rancher. I want to do, I want to be John Wayne. I don't know if he said that. <laughs> Graham kept saying, no, no, you're just bluffing yourself. There's no way. It's a big bluff. Don't do it. Blah, blah, blah. Well, if you see on the hat and I introduced myself for big bluff ranch. And so apparently the story goes, and it's almost the truth that uh, he packed her up in the uh, station wagon, drove her for four hours. And she's going, where the heck are we going? Pulled up onto the property and was like, here you go. The big bluff. So that, that is why we are big bluff ranch. We do have a big hill back here behind me. But um, the real name is because Graham thought that Grandpa couldn't actually be a rancher. So that was 1960. And he bought the ranch because he wanted to be a rancher, not because he was a rancher and knew how to buy agricultural property. So he bought this place essentially as a toy, a pretty darn big, expensive toy. Um, but it wasn't designed from the get-go to be a commercial standalone enterprise. It, it was just grandpa wanted to have fun and, and he did. So from 1960 through the late seventies, that's basically what he did. He um, just ran stockers, ran some hay, you know, just kind of did whatever he felt like doing. And it was fine because he was playing and he was being John Wayne and super happy. But as the boom started to bust, his business also started to go down. And he could eventually, by the late 80s, early 90s, or late 70s, early 80s, he couldn't just write checks to play with the ranch anymore. So by this time, my parents had moved up to the ranch permanently to uh, actually the picture of the house they live in is right behind my head here on my little back, back screen. It was the original bunkhouse. Actually, it was the original tack room of the ranch, right? So built in the you know early 1900s, converted over to a house. And 
my dad grew up sailing in Santa Barbara and when grandpa was like, okay, that's it. The, uh, the make accounts closed. Uh, my dad's like, oh, oh, now I have to make money at this. Oh, okay. I should probably figure out how to do that. So, um, because he didn't have kind of like, just, this is how things are done. He started poking around and there's this wacky African dude named Alan Savory with his buddy, um, Stan Parsons, who were just coming into the States and just starting to talk about their philosophy of holistic management. And so my dad and 82, I think it was, went to a seminar put on by Alan Savory, who talked about holistic management, who talked about all the stuff of moving your animals like the the Serengeti planes and electric fence and, you know, your your triple bottom line and all that sort of stuff. And it just really resonated with my dad. So in the early 80s, um, we were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Nothing of any significance so like he was putting up hay but only on 20 acres we were running cows but i think they had 30 pair at the time you know it was like a whole bunch of nothing he um and so working through holistic management really kind of cemented in my dad's mind that like oh the ranch even though it's not huge is um we're an extensive landscape we need to be running ruminants here so, so we stopped Pretty much stopped farming at that time. I was very short. I was five or six, something like that. Um, stopped farming, started building a lot of fence, started moving cows. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip forward. I realize this is a little long. I'm gonna skip forward through the 80s and 90s in two sentences. So in the 80s was building fence and managing the landscape. The 90s was changing our animal genetics to fit our landscape. We went from tall, skinny cows to short, wide cows. And then I graduated college in 2000, um, which is depressingly a long time ago at this stage. It used to be like that was just a couple of years ago. And now all of a sudden it's 23 years, 24 years ago. It's like, well, when did that happen? I'm no longer the young kid in the room. So, but what happened and the story is almost true is I graduated on a Friday and I was at a farmer's market with our grass fed beef on a Sunday that in late 99, Michael Pullen wrote the article Power Steer, and that was the beginning of the grass-fed beef era. And so we, because we knew the ranch was not a um, just kind of standalone, easy-to-run cow-calf operation, we needed to start capturing more uh, value for everything we could produce off the ranch. And we didn't really mean to become direct marketers, but we were just looking for that extra value. And so that's what we did. So through the 2000s, we did farmer markets. I was at farmer markets four or five a week. Um, we followed the Joe Salatin model and started trying to raise other animals. So we ran a couple hundred head of goat for a while. We ran up to 400 head of hair sheep for a while. Um we did a little tiny bit of chicken and we decided, no, chicken sucks. So our rule was two legs only, or I mean, four legs only. We're going to only raise things with four legs. And that meant the only left four-legged thing left was uh, bacon. So we started raising pasture pork and <laughs> that did not go well. We had a lot of wild pigs at the time and keeping a boar, a wild boar away from a domestic sow in heat with a couple of hot wires the sow would stay in, but the boar would also come in. There was, it was, it was a disaster. So we got out of that. Um, I started off with like a boar and two sows. And 18 months later, I sold 200 heads, uh, 200 head of pasture pork of various ages. It was nuts. I always joke that rabbits don't breed like rabbits. Pigs breed like rabbits. So that's, um, yep. So we got, so then we got out of that. And then it was, um, well, what do we do now? We're at farmer's markets. Everyone and their uncle at this point, 10, 12 years into grass-fed beef is at the farmer's market. None of them actually are calculating how much money they need. They're just selling it for a little bit more than grocery store. You know, we were selling our beef for what it was actually worth. And um, we just, we couldn't compete in that market. The only thing that we were doing or capable of doing that no one else would do was pasture poultry. 
So there was no one else dumb enough to do it. And we're like, hey, we're pretty dumb. We'll do that. So we got into pasture poultry and we built up to about 1,800 head a year processed on farm, direct marketed through farmer markets. And we were we were starting to run into a processing bottleneck that we didn't know how to, you know, process more chickens. That technically, if you're trying to process chickens and you pay, there's an on-farm exemption, technical details, whatever. But as soon as you hire an employee, you have to be, my understanding is you have to be USDA inspected. And we'd burnt through all of our friends and family processing chickens. Like they weren't coming back. Like, hey, we got a pr- we got processing in a couple of weeks. You coming? Click, 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 click. So then it was down to me, my wife, my parents, and um, one of our full-time employees who was not a processing employee. And it was that that was five of us. And we're trying to process chickens and we got all right, but we weren't super great at it. It was a it was a brutal couple of days to get you know three to five hundred head processed at once. Um, and then I went to a I went to a uh, conference where I met a guy who said he could raise more than he could sell, and we could raise more. He could sell more than he could raise. I really should get my joke right. He could raise more than he. <laughs> Damn it! I got it wrong again. He could sell more than he could raise, and we could raise way more than we could sell. Right. And so that was kind of the shift of for us to um, move away from direct marketing, everything we grew into more of a wholesale contract custom grazing operation. So we were at 1800 head a year direct marketed chicken. And as soon as we signed that contract, we went to 600 head of chicken per week year round, which was a big old jump. And then, um, you know, 14 years, I believe we've been doing this and we're, uh, we have the capability of growing 72,000 chickens per year now. So that's kind of been the tail that's wagged the dog of the ranch over the past, past 15 years is just figuring out how to lay, raise lots and lots of chickens at scale and then sell them to other people who slap their label on it and deal with all of the uh, accounts payable and accounts receivable and late pays and chefs who don't like it and chef who want this and all that sort of crap that I don't want to deal with. Because even though we're four hours away from the Bay Area, that's too far away to do all that handholding with chefs and, you know, grocery stores. And we never were too far away to hit many farmers markets. So That's kind of where we're at now. We are mostly pasture poultry. Um, We're probably going to do 30, 36, 32, 36,000 birds this year. Um, Hopefully I can sell more, Um, but that's what we're going to do this year. Uh, We still run about, (laughs) we're back down to 20 pair, kind of where grandpa was. Um, um, So we do a little bit of grass fed beef to friends and family type stuff, but mostly our rangeland, uh, we rent it out, so we've got uh, renter cows in here for the winter. They'll uh, ship out sometime in May, without. And then we have a little, we have a lake on the ranch that we do some agritourism on, and we do a hunting program. But basically, uh, every day, all day is chicken, chicken, chicken. So that's uh, didn't really want to, didn't plan to grow up to be a chicken farmer, but that's uh, turned out to be what I am. I'd much rather be a rancher, but darn, it turned into a farmer. Um. So that's kind of our our uh, background. Um, did that spark any questions? I mean, hop in here, people. I can keep going. I don't know if this is interesting, if this is crazy, if you want to move on to something else, just hop that's in. A per- perfect overview to kind of set the stage for where you're at right now. And um, so 36000 a year, you have the capacity to be able to double that. How, how do you figure the carrying capacity of uh, pasture poultry? Yeah, that that's an interesting question. So it's really you kind of for we we eyeball it. So um, basically, we what, what kind of footprint are you with right. thirty six yeah. thousand? That's kind of getting so we ran uh, the conversion from a cow to a chicken. Right, right, right. So it's it's not a it's not there's you you can't really go to your standard animals. Um, stocking rate and just do the conversion where, you know, like five sheep is one, you know, one cow or whatever. I mean, they actually do have that conversion in some of the standard animal tables, but the thing is, 
and this is going to be <laughs> okay. We're going to go here. I, I've done this. I've done my little mini lecture about this a couple of times and I'll, I'll see what you guys think about it. Um, so there's going to be a little tiny bit of audience participation. So uh, you got to pay attention here. So when Alan Savory or anyone else talks about regenerative ranching, they immediately kind of go to talking about Africa and the Serengeti and, you know, wildebeest and whatever, and they're being chased by lions. And they're like, okay, wildebeest equals cows. And then they'll work down, they'll be like sheep equals, you know, whatever, a little, a, little, a small, you know, kind of grazer, nibbler. And then goats equal pronghorn or some sort of, you know, browser, right? So we have equivalents, right? We can go beef to bison, beef to whatever. We can go goats to, you know, whatever. Like there's kind of a thing and you can kind of picture like, oh, I understand that, you know, buffalo were herded by wolves and Indians and they moved and fires and all this sort of stuff. Like there's kind of an intuitive understanding of that situation. Now, now this is where the audience participation kicks in. And um, I hope you prove me wrong, but I have been thinking and researching for the past about year. Can someone tell me a natural analog of a chicken, a flock of chickens? So a three to five pound bird that doesn't fly kind of walks and doesn't take up lots of acres stays on you know two to three acres in any one spot right this is, you know people have said oh the prairie chickens and i'm like well a they're not big enough and b they fly they cover a lot of area oh what about turkeys well again they're a lot bigger and they also cover a lot of acres we're just we <laughs> we don't really mean to but we kind of enable some uh, wild turkey population so we've got 60 to 100 wild turkeys that kind of benefit from us having chicken feed around. Um, but we were just talking about where we seen them and they cover probably a thousand acres. You know, they three miles down that way to the neighbors and, you know, a mile that way to the other neighbor, you know, so they're covering lots of territory. So the, what I'm circling back around to as far as stocking rate and kind of equivalencies that there is really no natural, unless someone can prove me wrong, I'd be interested to know. There's no natural equivalent to a, a domesticated chicken, the way we're raising them. Like it just doesn't exist in nature. So what that means in my mind is that we don't have a natural analog where we can kind of go out and be like, oh, well, in Africa, the wildebeest kind of do this when they're operating naturally. Right. So we can't really have a natural analog and be like, oh, okay, well, when the chickens are done, you know, this is what it should look like or what it could look like. You know, we're, we're making this up that this chicken, chicken industry is totally artificial. I'm trying not, I'm trying to keep my rabbit trails down to one. Cause we could talk also about why uh, we re eat so much chicken and why it's not really uh, biologically appropriate, but maybe we'll save that rabbit trail for a little bit later. But let's say that we don't understand what natural chicken impact would be so what that does is that doesn't quite free us but it, it leaves us to choose our own adventure so there's two main schools of pasture poultry production um one the super main one like probably 85 to 90 percent is the joel salton uh pens the daily moves uh, you know, you can have like the little pens that hold, you know, 50 to 60 birds. And then you go all the way up to Paul Grieve and Pasture Bird and they've got 6,000 in this, you know, geese. Okay, but how, but they fly, right? I mean, that's the thing is that they're, how many acres a flock of geese is going to take? They might hit an acre for, I'm going to make this up, hit an acre for a couple of days and then they're gone. Like they're migrating. So they're grazing from Mexico all the way up to Canada, at least out here. So that, yeah, is a good idea. I, I'm, I see where you're coming. I'm not sure that's, that's what. Yeah. And I'm the one that invited you down that rabbit trail. So that's, that's probably a side note, but again. Um, oh, right. Are, well, I will get to my answer. I'm getting to my okay. answer. So you, the answer the is that we have two main production styles of pasture poultry. Um, tame geese. 
in something 30 acres water source. Okay. I'm going to think about that. Let, I'll, let me finish my rabbit trail, but thank you. That, that is an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, two main ways of growing chickens. You have the daily moves. So you're, you're basically fast growth, like fast moves and you come back to a spot quickly. Then there is a much smaller style of poultry production, which we do, which we would call day range. Um, it's, there is, um, French, there's a portion of French chicken production that does this. And so these guys, this is more of a heavy impact, um, long recovery period. And so that's what we do. So we basically nuke an area, lots of impact, really heavy impact, lots of manure load and all this sort of stuff. We mitigate it, but we don't come back to that spot for at least a growing season sometimes too. Whereas the daily moves come often. So basically what you're doing is you're looking at your impact on the land, looking at your recovery rate, and that's telling you what your stocking rate is. So in our situation with our um, day range model, I'm thinking we're at about 3,000 birds per acre. It's kind of what I figure. Um, but that's one time, 3,000 birds for not even six weeks, and that's it for 12 months. Right. So, but if you're doing daily moves, you're looking at, you know, 3,000 birds is probably on, I don't know, 10 acres. Like it changes because you're moving more often. So, and are, you, are you following up with livestock or, or are those, is that your only species that is going to graze that acre or those acres? Yeah. Yeah. So, we, we have not had any luck grazing cows close to chickens in the same field, you know, using an electric fence to keep them apart. It works until it doesn't. And the problem is that chicken feed is basically heroin for cows. <laughs> like they get a taste get and you're, you're just like fighting it, fighting it, fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. So we don't keep cows in the same field as the chickens, but we do rotate the ch cows through fields that chicken fields that don't have chickens in them. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. So basically this field is chicken production this year. No cows allowed, but last year's chicken field has cows cycling through it. So we're, we're, you know, uptaking the nitrogen with all the plants. We're laying it down. We're getting the soil microbes going. And um, when I hop into my pictures here in a little bit about some of our production, you'll also see that we'll take um, some bedding. We compost it, windrow it, and then we'll take that and spread it out on the rangeland. So that's another way that we kind of... Um, mitigate our our impacts we're starting to mess around more actively with cover crops to come behind these hoops um, and get some interesting stuff growing in them we actually completely by accident had the coolest dry farm pumpkin patch this year so what we do we take our chicken scrap our kitchen scraps take them out to the chickens and like hey eat through it if you will and last, not this summer, but last Thanksgiving uh, or Halloween, you're scooping out and you have all the seeds from your, your pumpkins, your jack-o'-lanterns, took it out, got composted up in the uh, chicken bedding that I'll, I will show you. And the seeds didn't, it wasn't hot enough, so the seeds didn't get cooked, but they were in this bedding. We never put chickens back on it. And we grew, I don't know, we probably grew 80 pumpkins dry farm, just totally dry farm it was amazing so now we're getting all excited like oh what we should do is we should be coming back we should do that on purpose what if we come back into these hoops and uh do some uh you know proactive dry farming what can we do what else can we get out of this little spot so um well yeah anyways. well let's let's jump into your pictures and we'll kind of go through that and then we can open it up for questions so yeah, this 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 was kind of my subtitle. So we've been doing this for 14 years, and I don't know if I've actually killed a million dollars worth of chickens, but basically the only way you can figure out how to keep a chicken live is to kill a lot of chickens, which is I figured that joke would work in this environment. I don't think I'd necessarily be making that joke if I'm trying to sell chickens to, you know, like consumers, but uh animals die. Like we do our absolute best, but things happen. Um, so we've got, we've, we've been doing this a long time and we've, we've learned a lot of, <laughs> killed a lot of chickens and learned how to keep a lot of them alive. So I already went through my ranch history. Uh, I guess it wasn't too long because you guys are still here. Um, 
So this is a literal aerial overview of how we are raising chickens. So what we do is um, day range, right? So these are, you can see we have individual hoops. When we have birds in them, we link them all together. And we have, so this little hoop right here has got 1,500 birds in it. This hoop right here has 1,500 birds in it. And mm -hmm. then those guys are, you can see them walking around that are out on pasture. Then this hoop back here down in the next field, this is our brooder. So that's, um, you'll see pictures of that in a sec. So that's young birds inside under heat getting big enough to come out on pasture. And you can see right here, these hoops, we just harvested birds. We're knocking down this infrastructure. And then um, when we pull all the hoops off, then we come back and you'll see that we compost behind. This is how we... Um, on a literal high level, raise our chickens. We are in one spot. So we brood them in one spot. We open up the doors at the appropriate age. The bigger they get, the farther the walk they walk, the more fresh pasture they get for themselves. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't move their hoops. We never handle them. We don't mess with them. It's just very, it works very well for chickens. I mean, what I try and do is I try and take the best of the daily move stuff. I try and take the best of the conventional set barns and kind of put them together into a system like this. So with a 72, well, actually the guys are in some of these pictures here in a sec for 72,000 birds a year, I only need two full-time guys out there. Right. So we're, we're pretty darn labor efficient. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the things we gain from not doing daily moves. We also gain um, the ability to um, raise more birds in a spot. Um, you know, we need more spots, but we can we can really concentrate our animals. Um, anyways, so I'm I'm in this house. I'm sitting right back there in the corner. That's the original ranch house. That's where my wife and I live. I'm in my sister's childhood bedroom. Is now my office unless they're visiting um yeah barn our feed gets dropped off up here we get 24 tons at a time yeah and you can tell we have lots of neighbors it's it's terrible i have so many neighbors around um doesn't look like california <laughs> <laughs> not enough right. people. it looks like what, the, what, what is the footprint that we're looking at here just to kind of get oh yeah yeah sure so the overall all. ranch the total ranch is about four thousand acres these okay two fields that you're kind of looking at that we have chickens in these are our winter pastures this is um like 25 26 acres depending on kind of how you uh run your Good. google maps so okay. we've got dense we've got about 60 acres total of flatland bottomland that we can raise chickens on so we run kind of sort of the same 20 25 acres in the winter just because of the creek we can't we're limited by some geography but then when we go to our summer pasture, we have two chunks of 20 acres and we rotate between those two 20 chunks. So each each 20 acres gets uh, summer pasture gets a full year to break a uh, break. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, how we move the hoops. We've got a 6000 pound rough terrain forklift, four wheel drive forklift, some custom homemade fork extensions. These hoops are 12 foot wide by 20 foot long. Uh, that's um, chain link top rail that we bend ourselves. This covering is um, sometimes it's used billboard tarps. Um, sometimes it's new, but billboard tarps, they're great. We still have some of our original tarps are still in use 10, 12 years later. Um, oh. And we just pick it up, move it around, drop it where it needs to be. Um this is what our brooders look like. So we're, we're mo modular in what we do. So each one of these hoops will hold a certain number of birds. And if you need to grow more birds, you just drop in another hoop on your, your setup. So right. this is the brooder. So we've got one, two, three, and the photographer's in the hoop number four. Four hoops is going to hold, um, we've got about 1,600 chicks in here probably at the time of this picture. So mm -hmm. we've got the uh, nipple waters over here. So that's something I stole from the big guys. It's possible, but harder to have nipple waters in your daily moves. Um, we've got 
you know, feeders here, we go from trays to yellow feeders and we've got yellow or red feeders. You're always matching your infrastructure to the size of the bird. So those nipple waters move up every couple of days when they're chicks. Um, the feeders get lifted up on these homemade and we call them lift kits. So we're always changing the level of the feed presentation. Basically chickens don't have lips, right? So the less they have to like hold something in their mouth to throw it back to swallow, the more efficiently they're going to eat. So you want the water up at about a 45 degree angle to their neck. So the water literally drops down their throat and you want their feed just basically beak level. So they just kind of do this and they throw it back. Mm. Um, which another way of saying that is that our job as um, stewards of these birds while they're around is to create an environment that chickens are not smart. I'm not going to say they're smart, but they have a really well-developed set of, set of instincts. You know, something flies over them. They want to hide um, something, uh, you know, the rain. So our job is to set up the environment such that their instincts work and they don't have to use any of their brain power. So that's all about what I just said about trying to set the level of their feed right uh, for them, for their water right, to open the doors at the right time, to keep them closed, um, to set up the heater so they can hunt and peck for their comfort level, all this sort of stuff. Um, so that's that's our job is to to understand the instincts of the birds, create an environment that works for them, and then go from there. And that also means that there are other ways of creating environment. This is just the one we've done. It works well. We've modeled on other things, but there are other environments. There's the conventional guys that have big barns can do all the exact same things we do. Daily move guys can do the exact same thing we do. So it's all kind of a, a matter of setting up this environment for your context such that you can take care of the birds the way they need to be taken care of and have it fit your context. So we're in the brooder here for, depending on the season, two to three weeks. And then you can just barely see on the corner right here, a little taller piece of plywood. Those are what we call side or back here. Those are side doors. That's how we get in when we're, you know, taking care of the birds. And as soon as they look like they're old enough based on the weather and the, how they're feathered out and their size, we just open up those doors and they're where they need to be. There's no stress of moving from a separate brooder to a um, pasture pen, which I think is actually, a, chickens don't like change. They want tomorrow to be like yesterday. And so the less change we provide them, the easier it is for them to understand their life and to be happy. So moving from a brooder environment all the way into a daily pen is actually pretty stressful on them because they're like, I've never seen grass. I've never seen this water. So Anyways, I think this is a, a pretty big benefit to our production cycle where we can just open up the doors and they are where, they, where they're going to be. So we do that. We open them up. And then these guys are mature birds. You can see them. So we have much bigger range feeders, gravity feeders. Uh, we've added a whole bunch more hoops. The doors are bigger for them. And this is, um, this is the way we kind of manage the nitrogen load from their manure is that we bring in extra bedding. So this is one of the downsides to our situation that um, the conversion ratio of a chicken is three pounds of feed to one pound of chicken. And what that means is that there's kind of sort of two pounds of poop that comes out of that equation. No, ever, no one ever really talks about the two pounds of poop, but it's definitely there and it's something that you got to figure out. And so this is what we do is we'll go in here and we'll spread bedding, put down a layer of bedding, so that's basically the carbon to bind up with the nitrogen from their poop. And we just kind of layer it, layer it, layer it. And we'll end up with, uh, they call it cake. This is an industry term, actually. They call it cake. You'll end up with probably about 10 to 12 inches of cake um, when we're done with the flock. And uh, let's see. Yeah. And then, so... I'm at some point I'm going to talk a little bit about some, if anyone's interested in doing chickens or has questions, we can totally go into that. But I think it, to, if you're thinking about getting into chickens, the very first question you should think about is how you're going to process them or yeah. First or second question is how the heck are you going to process them? That it's not 
it's not easy to get beef processed. It's even harder to find a custom processor for chicken. So luckily there is, there are, there are one, eh, there's two processors in California who do custom chicken processing. And we're lucky to work with one of them. We've been with them for like 12 years. And so this is how they like to receive chicken. So these modules are called modules. They're uh, four foot by eight foot by five foot. Um, yeah, I should have had a better picture, but they've got doors on them. They've got 10 doors on them. Each door you can load between 20 to 30 chickens, 25 to 30 chickens, depending on temperature and size of the bird. So each one of those modules basically holds 300 head and you just stack them on your trailer. That's our homemade modified chicken trailer. And you just stack on birds until <laughs> you've got the whole flock harvested. So that one is holding one, two. Well, you don't see it all that, that trailer right there can hold 3,600 birds. Um, and we have a crew of five guys and we can catch um, 3,600 birds in, I don't know, about an hour and a half. It's taken, taken us a while to get to that level, but that's uh, it's about industry standard, which is pretty cool. Where it's uh, it's it's kind of like working calves. It's like the day that you don't really want to do, but it's fun, but you don't really want to do, but it's always about like, well, how many do we get done today? It's kind of the same thing as catching chickens. You're like, it's hard work, but you feel pretty accomplished at the end of it when you got that whole trailer is full of chickens to go off and uh, make you some money. How far is the haul to the processor? Yeah, so they're actually close to us. They're only four hours away. Wow. So, that's yeah. chicken. What's a shrink on a chicken on four hours? Never mind. Uh, that's, in, that's, that's in the weeds again. Yeah, um, it is in the weeds. So we don't actually, well, I mean, I guess I could track it. It's, but it's not easily trackable because you don't really, we don't deal in live weight. That everything we're selling is carcass based. So by the time I actually start selling things, like they're already dead packaged and, and I'm just selling a carcass. So there is definitely shrinkage. Um, there's very little DOA. Um, so the way we catch chickens is that, um, you know, the saying chickens always come home, come home to roost, right? They always sleep in the same spot and chickens get really dopey when they're asleep. I, don't, I mean, some of you guys have probably messed with chickens at night, right? That's, that's when you want to catch them, not during the day. During the day, they die of heart attacks. So we catch these birds, you know, starting at about half hour after sundown, catch them, we'll get them loaded, and they need to be at the processor about four in the morning. So that if you do your math, that means you have to leave the ranch at roughly midnight. Um, so when I had to do the chicken run, that sucked. That was like, you know, an hour, an hour nap from like 11 to midnight after catching chickens and I'd have to haul them down. Uh, luckily we now have a driver who hauls for us. Um, but anyways, you get there for, so the way it basically works out is they fall asleep and then they wake up and they're dead or they're dead before they wake up, something like that. So it's actually for the way we do it, super low stress because we're, we're working with the bird's natural cycle with their, their instincts. So the big conventional guys, they don't necessarily have that luxury. They just have to catch when they catch. So they'll end up catching during the day and they have to do tricky things with the lights or I've heard rumors that they'll uh, put Prozac in the water to calm the birds down and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. So um, predator control. Well, you're looking at some of the predator con control right now. <laughs> so we've got guard dogs. We've got um, portable poultry netting and that's more to keep the dogs in than to keep anything out because coyotes go under bobcats pop over hawks don't even notice then we've got um perimeter um uh, depending on the field we either have four or five hot wire three and a half hours and nine and a half pounds is that live weight holy moly those are huge um mini turkeys um the uh, right guard dogs and then uh, we got trail cam set up so really we sh ah, cool <laughs> that's that's uh yeah i mean that's about the the yeah our cutting percentage would be about the same as yours a nine pound bird would be a six and a half pound carcass yeah um so uh 
And then also, yeah, trail cam. So if we start having a real problem, that's me and a flashlight and a shotgun, and most problems go away pretty quickly once you get to that stage. Um, uh, and another way of thinking about the um, the way I think about uh, predator control is uh, you can't really stop it. Like the hawks, like we've none of our dogs care about hawks. I always hear about people's guard dogs chasing off aerials and raptors and our raptors and our dogs are just like oh cool yeah thanks that was interesting so at, at some point we're always going to have a predation problem and that i basically think of it as like a tithe to mother nature so if we just kind of build in a you know some factor five percent of uh death loss that we're just kind of accept that it's going to happen and just be like well that's that's our tithe to mother nature build it into the pricing and and we go for there. And that, you know, if it goes beyond our tie to mother nature, then we definitely step up our, uh, our, uh, you know, guard duties. But that's, that's kind of uh, my thoughts about predation. Um, and that's, so another way of looking at that is the, um, let's, you know, I don't know if this is an exact number, but let's just say a hawk will eat two chickens a day. So if you have only a hundred chickens, two chickens a day adds up pretty quick. But if you have 3000 chickens, two chickens a day is not that big a deal, right? So to some degree, you just outproduce your predation problem. You're obviously trying to keep it minimized. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just like, Hey, coyotes come eat whatever you want, but that the, the slippage to mother nature, you just, produce more and that on a percentage basis it becomes less noticeable so uh this is just kind of maybe an outside picture of the chickens out there on grass you can see their hoops and their their feeders and and uh looking back across the creek there um so this is they what our process to, pardon they don't try to roost in the trees oh no 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 these guys are lazy you know you're, yeah. you're gonna get so it goes back to my saying, chickens come home to roost, work with their instincts. Chickens become very geospatially located. Like they are going to sleep in the exact same spot all the time, right next to the same people all the time. Like they've got their whole little buddy set up. They're not going to uh, uh, really change. So if you go, if you think back to our aerial picture, you can kind of picture how far we had those hoops separated. Well, that basically is about, twice the distance they're willing to walk so what they'll do is they get out during the day they walk up two different flocks to walk out in the middle they hang out hey who are you what's going on this is interesting oh wait sun's going down everyone go home and they all just go right back so if i had layers layers i'd worry about roosting in trees layered us i'd worry about wandering away these meat birds they're they're pretty fat and lazy so they don't they don't roam too much. We can, we can work with their, their instincts to just, you know, just keep everything in the same spot and they're, they're happy. They don't go anywhere. Oh yeah. If anyone wants to come visit, I'm going to have my uh, contact info here at the end. So um, yeah, come on by. So, oops. Oh, we missed the, yeah. So this is what our uh, chicken processor, this is what our chickens turn into. This is what we're, we're doing a little bit of direct to consumer these days. And this is also a lot of our, not a lot, many of our wholesale clients just buy our chicken and then resell it. So they want our name on the label. We also white label a fair amount or we'll co-label, co-pack. So sometimes their label will be at top and we'll have a little label on the bottom. But, you know, it's very, <laughs> it, it makes life possible to be a chicken farmer if you have access to a, um, USDA processing facility. And then, yeah, turns into yummy chicken. So we're a certified organic, obviously pasture raised, no corn, no soy. And just all of the stuff we do, you know, we have, we have really good chicken. <laughs> it just, you do the things, the right things. I mean, you don't even have to do all of the things right. If you just do the most of the things right, you get a pretty awesome chicken. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where we end up. So our chicken is pretty stinking stupid expensive, but it's worth it. It's really good. 
Um, so let's see here. Okay. Well, I've been talking. Uh, oh, I was going to say, anyone got questions? Uh, yeah. So what do we feed? So our, our feed is mostly a wheat, um, wheat based with, um, uh, canola meal as the, uh, as the protein source. So we would like to move away from canola meal, obviously. Um, but that's what we, um, that's what we can get access to easily when you're buying 24 tons of feed. So we're too big to make our own feed, but we're too small to make our own feed. So we have to go off and work with custom mills to buy feed. Um, so to some degree I'm held hostage by what the mills have in their ingredient list. And so wheat is good. I get certified or this is all certified organic. Um, so the wheat is, is good. Canola meal. Like I'm really trying to get into like field peas or something else like that, but it's tough to have the mill have enough ingredients to mill it for us and changing our feed often, um, messes with your flavor profiles. It's not dramatic but it does mess things up like chickens like tomorrow to be like yesterday so if you're going field peas for this batch of feed then we're back to canola fe canola meal for this batch like that's not going to work you need to kind of keep everything consistent so until i can nail down a consistent supply of something a, a better type of protein we're on the canola meal um uh where do we get our chicks from so that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of an amusing question um uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll turn it back on in a sec, but and that's just making me hungry for dinner. Um, the so it's surprising. So when you start looking at your cost of goods sold, how much it costs to actually raise a chicken, um, the cost of your chick is actually turns out to be a surprisingly high percentage. I mean, feed is the most expensive. Processing is usually second, but the cost of the chick itself is usually third. And then labor and other stuff, it all kind of blends in a, a bit below that. But if you are trying to set up your, uh, your own chicken enterprise, it's very, very important to find the cheapest chick possible. Um, and so for us, uh, we've been doing it long enough. We kind of got this weird grandfather deal where we are actually buying chicks that would be going into um, Pittman Farms, which is a, a, a regional conventional barn operation. Um, and so we actually have a pretty sweetheart, awesome deal on how much our chicks cost. Um, but that being said, uh, they get shipped in the mail to us like everyone else's chicks. So, um, if you're, if you're looking for chicks, you know, really you're trying to look for, it doesn't really matter. They're all Cornish cross. So really you're shopping on price and you're shopping on shipping. Um, but shipping is not quite so important. Like we've raised every type of chicken over the years. So we've done freedom rangers. We've done, well, ducks aren't chickens, but we've done ducks. We've done heritage. We've done, you know, heritage rooster, you know, we've done it all. And when we did Freedom Rangers, that hatchery is back in Pennsylvania, I believe. Anyways, it's on the East Coast. And those chicks would get shipped to us um, the same day that our chicks that are shipped, our Cornish Cross chicks were shipped to us. And they show up on the same time frame. So shipping across the country is not a big deal. I mean, it's better if it didn't travel the, that far, but it's fine. So the trick with baby chicks and the reason they can ship them is that there is, they have enough nutrition for 72 hours, I believe, left over from the yolk when they hatch. So they don't need to get on feed and water right away. They're just kind of living off what's left of their, their, their egg, all the stuff they did in, in, in utero or whatever you would call it. It's not in utero because they don't have a utero, but it's in something or other in egg, in ovo. I don't know. So the, um, so anyways, that's where we get chips. They, we get them shipped like everyone else. The closer they are, the better. But shipping them for a couple of days in the mail is no big deal. Um, and then, yeah, try and try and find it as cheap a chick price as possible. And that's going to mean probably talking to a big conventional barn and try and like steal some some chicks off the back of the 
uh, back up back of the truck before they uh, place them in their own barns. Um, Let's talk. This is a, this is great. I mean, even you know, I I have no aspirations to necessarily go raise chickens, but it's just fascinating to me to learn um, the systems that you have in place and how you've been able to make it work. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the margins are, the financial side of it, and sure. uh, how how that's working for you? Because I mean, it seems like this would be definitely be your center priest enterprise, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Your operation, and so um, so obviously it's got to be working. And, and um, along with that, are there? Um, I I think anybody, even in the commodity market, the livestock market. We're at record high prices, but we're still feeling a huge pinch because of increased expenses. And is that affecting you as well? To, um, and what are those that you're seeing? What are those expenses? Is it feed costs? Is it labor? What? <clears throat> right. Right. So we <laughs> we do a lot of pasture poultry. I mean, this is this is this is our thing, but it is actually <laughs> kind of a dumb enterprise to get into. Because we, we are, we are, we don't make, our cost of production is not really under our control, right? The majority of our cost of goods is buying feed, which is based on, we're buying it from a mill. The mill is buying their stuff on the commodity market. Is there hedges and futures and global trade? Like when the Ukrainian thing took off, like wheat just went through the roof and that, you know, we ended up seeing that in our feed cost. So the chickens, there's just a lot of inputs to chicken. So our, our biggest feed cost and, you know, people who are already raising chickens or not living in California are probably going to fall out of your seats when I tell you some of the things, the general numbers of what things cost for us. So our feed um, right now for our certified organic, no corn, no soy is running about $900 a ton uh, for our grower, or excuse me, it's more of a finisher. Our chick starter, I believe is just, just under $1,100 a ton, um, which is super expensive. In general, organic feed is about double-ish what uh, conventional feed was. So um, our wholesale price is about 615 a pound for our certified organic stuff. If I'd change nothing except the word from organic to conventional, we could probably drop down to 515, maybe even five bucks a pound. That's how that's how much a, a lever the cost of feed has on your um, final price. It's it is the biggest expense. So either you go the route we go, or we're just like screw it all. We're just going for the highest dollar possible, right? We, we spare no expense. Like this is the best of the best of the best. The, the most persnickety person out there is going to eat our chicken. There's no, you know, if you have a soy allergy, you can eat our chicken. If you're worried about GMOs, you can eat our chicken. If you worry about ah, da, 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 da. there's yeah. So then, so yeah, so we're at, you know, on average, call it 950 bucks a ton of feed all in. Um, and that if you compare that to the Midwest, you know, our feed cost is, um, way up there, right? Cause the feed is being trucked from the Midwest out here, milled and then hauled four hours from the mill or four and a half hours from the mill up to us. So, uh, you know, a fundamental, uh, flaw structural issue with our chicken enterprise is that we are not in chicken country. It does come with some silver linings. But everything is far away from us. Our feed mill is far away from us. Our processor is far away from us. So, you know, per flock of 3,000 chickens, we probably have, oh, geez, I'd be scared to think about it. I've never thought of it this way. I bet you we probably have four to $5,000 of just freight built into the cost of that flock of chickens. And, you know, paying for the feed to come up, paying for the birds to go to the processor, paying for the chicks to get shipped all that sort of stuff. Like we're in the middle of nowhere. We pay a lot for freight, um, which sucks. Um, processing costs um, change. depends a little bit if we're doing whole birds versus parted out birds versus bulk pack versus individually cryo vac. Um, but we're on average, we're at about five, 
five bucks per bird to process. So on a four pound carcass, you know, that's a buck 25 is our processing cost. So, you know, we're looking at buck 25 a pound for processing our feed. I could do the math. I don't know it quite off the top of my head. I mean, I do, but it's, you know, probably in the two bucks to no. Yeah. More than two, probably pushing close to three bucks a pound on our feed cost. Um, so just between feed and processing, that's over half of what we have into it. Um, we're at like if a buck, we're at about probably 30 to 40 cents per mature bird and chick cost somewhere in that range. Um, so yeah, we're, we're charging a lot of money for our chicken, but we're not really making all that much money. It's not like, Oh, wow. You're getting $6 a pound. You can't believe that, that you must be making so much money. It's like, Nope, Nope, Nope. That's, that is pretty much the minimum reasonable margin is built into that. So if you think about your three pro three uh, keys to profit that ranching for profit always talks about, you have increased turnover, increase your margins or decrease your overheads. Well, we're cheap and broke farmers. Our overheads don't get much smaller than we're at. Um, our margins are um, as, as good as they're going to get. We're not going to be able to charge anything more than what we're at. So really we're set up where our, our, our growth potential is in increasing turnover, generally speaking. So we just need to sell a hell of a lot more chicken. So on a per head basis, our margin's decent, but our overall turnover is not, because I skipped, there's a big chunk of our story that I kind of skipped. Um, our The reason we're not doing 72,000 chickens a year is that we had, um, and we knew it was a bad idea all along, but it just, it is what it was. We only had one buyer. So we had one buyer going into COVID and as COVID hit, that blew that contract up. And then miraculously, we had another single buyer step in and take over for the like 12 months after COVID. And um, the um, <laughs> then they had a complete issue and they blew up. And so for the past two years, I've been looking for the unicorn. Who's going to buy 72,000 chickens a year for me at super expensive prices? And uh, they don't exist. I've tried. They're not out there. So we've built back handfuls of little um uh little retailers that we sell to and they, they can handle the price um but really our way forward as far as i can tell to increase our turnover is to go dr back into our roots of direct to consumer so that's we got a value-added producer grant we're about to spend a lot of your tax dollars thank you very much for paying taxes to um direct market our go back into direct marketing e-commerce e our chicken um, so yeah, th those are kind of rough numbers, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. So it's fair, it, fair enough. A couple of questions. Yeah. In the chat yeah and... I got uh, There's a couple. So we keep the chickens oh. in the brooder, Brian, it's about, it really depends on the weather and the birds. Like in the summer, like we could let them out at, you know, seven, eight, 10 days. We'll probably wait to 14. We've got to kind of dial down where everything happens in weekly increments. So basically in the summer, we'll probably let them out around day 14, 10 to 14. In the winter this time of year, it's going to be longer, maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks. Depends on the weather, depends on how they feather out that you can kind of, you can, you can tell like there's, you, you raise birds, right? So there's that stage where they've got the fuzz on the head, but they've got full feathers on their body. That's when you know that they are they're going to be able to handle outside weather or you know reasonable outside weather. So you kind of we kind of eyeball it based on how they feather out based on their the outside temperature, what the next three, four days are gonna look like as far as the temperature. So you know, if it's gonna be a cold snap, you know, we don't let them out. If it's gonna dump rain, we don't let them out. We wait, we try and let to have them two to three days of decent weather when we first let them out. And how long do we keep them in finishing? So we are at, oh God, me, Alfred and I argue all the time. He, he, it's silly. We should know exactly to the day. He says it's one day. He, he says it's um 47 days and I say it's 44 or something like that. But we're, we're just that. Yeah. So we're just, we're just over 
oh, those numbers are actually wrong. We're just over seven weeks on no corn, no soy for a four pound carcass on average, which is pretty decent. And we're, we're pretty happy with, pretty happy with that. Uh, let's see. How do we find our buyers? Well, this sucks. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll tell you what I did. It doesn't work great. Is that you go on the internet and you start Googling anyone who has anything to do with meat sales. So talk to, you know, Google all the high end meat distributors on the West coast. I call them all cold, call them all. I got introduced to some of them. They were like, oh, this is amazing. You have the best chicken in the whole world. I want a sample. You send them a sample like, oh, this really is the best chicken in the whole world. This is fantastic. You got to have it. My customers are going to love it. How much is it? $2 a pound? And you're like, nope, six. And they're like, ah, you have the worst chicken in the entire world. I'm never going to talk to you again. So, it, I mean, that was to some degree what I did. I cold called. I spent a lot of time on the internet. I still do cold calling anyone who looks like they're selling um anything so in fact that's how i cold called jared because i was going down this uh um kind of rabbit trail of like hey you're a grass-fed beef guy selling direct to consumer that tells me that you're smart enough and interested enough to do direct to consumer but since you're not selling chicken that means you're smart enough to not <laughs> raise chicken but you're probably smart enough to want to sell chicken so hey i'm pretty dumb i'm raising chicken you're pretty smart why don't you try and buy my chicken and uh sell it to your customers. Um, so that's, that's how I found pretty much all of our customers is I just cold called everyone in the entire world. And, um, it's yeah, that whole networking thing's a pain in the butt. It's like, man, I got to talk to another stranger and be charming and interesting and care about them. I just wanted to buy chicken, but I'll pretend for a while. Um, so yeah, it's, there's no, and so what that was, that, okay. So, it sounds like Brian, at least you're into chickens, probably maybe some other people are into chickens. So the thing about chickens is that you can't just do it for the fertility and be like, oh, I'll just sell them at the auction yard. Every single chicken you raise, you have to direct market somehow, right? There's no commodity market. You can't put them up on Western livestock, right? There's no video market that's going to buy chicken from you. So as much as you would want to raise chicken for all the fertility reasons that it's really the wrong reason. Like chicken is an enterprise where you work from your customer backwards. Like you got to know who you can sell to first. You got to know if they need a USDA or the on farm. Do they want whole birds? Do they want have parts? Can you get in? Okay. Once you figure that out, can I get into the process or what's the harvest dates? Like I literally last October, had to give all of my harvest dates to my processor for this year. And I still don't have all my orders dialed in. So I just totally took a wild ass guess just so I had slots at the processor to get my birds processed. Right. And that's only because she likes me because I've been around for, you know, 12 years, you know, so that the getting your processor really dialed in is super important. So, and then you got to figure out where you're going to buy feed from. And then you got to figure out how much it all costs. Like this, this chicken enterprise. Yeah. I joke around and call myself dumb to do it. And I may or may not be dumb to do it, but you have to be pretty cognizant of all of the moving parts. Like, you know, your feed, your processing, you have to be willing to go out there and direct market it somehow, either in wholesale lots to other retailers or um, direct market it to consumers. And then if you're into the consumer game, then like there's a whole bunch of customer you know, interactions, like, do you want to do it? So the, it, the reality is, is that it is not hard to raise a chicken. You can do it wrong. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> generally speaking, it's easy to raise chicken. You have feed, you have water, you have chick, you have time, boom, chicken grown, done, right? You can raise them in a barn. You can raise them on a, in a tractor. You can raise, you know, right. It's not, that hard to do a basically decent job of raising chicken. The hardest part of raising chicken is making the enterprise work. Who are you going to sell it to? Can you make enough money? How are you going to handle con, you know, contracts? Like what's going to happen if that person bails on you? Never trust a restaurant who says they're going to buy a thousand chickens a week. It's just not going to happen. Right? So they're the, the skill in raising pasture poultry is not the animal husbandry. I mean, you have to have it. The skill in pasture poultry is the 
um, I don't know what to call it, call it enterprise creation, value creation, the uh, whole, you know, it, the whole business. It's a whole business. You don't just raise some chickens for the fun of it. Like there is, there is all the stuff that you have to deal with first. The market, <laughs> marketing is probably the biggest uh, piece. It sounds like to be able to do it profitably, right. being able to being able to charge enough so there's a margin. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a, I mean, if you want to kind of like strain the push pull metaphor, ruminants could be a push. Like you can just push them out into the conventional market, just dump them. Like you can push out and take whatever price you want. There's no push market available for chicken. It's only pull. You can only sell to someone who's asking for it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, so you need to be putting yourself in a position where people know that you're doing it so they know to ask you right and even though we've been doing this for 14 years no one calls me for chicken <laughs> right <laughs> i don't get i would love to get cold call for chicken like it would be so amazing if someone just called me up out of the blue was like hey i want chicken it's like well i guess i has happened once but 99 percent of the time it is me cold calling and then the other problem is that these deal cycles take forever because you got to get them interested and they want to sample and then they got to do this. And then like, you know, depending on who you're selling to, they're always doing something else. So basically if you have a person that's interested, the fastest I've ever gone from, yes, I want to buy my chicken to here's your chicken. Where's my check was six months. I mean, that's fast. Usually we're talking like a year or years where I'm just like knocking at the door, like, Oh, Hey, I'm still here. And then eventually like their other chicken buyer goes away for whatever reason you slot in and then you never, you never miss. I mean, that's the other thing about this is that you, you know, your main competitor is conventional chicken. It is super cheap. It is super consistent. It is super available and that you will never be super cheap. And you already have one strike against you. So if you ever mess up your consistency or you ever mess up, you know, you know, your availability or something like that, like you're already one or two strikes, right? It takes very little for one of your contracts to drop you. So, you know, especially at our scale, you know, that <laughs> you just can't mess up. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You just, you can't, there's no wiggle room you are on the tight wire all the time you know so we always buy a little more chicks than we need you know we're always talking to the buyer ahead of time i didn't show you a picture of it i've got this really cool chicken scale that gives me the average weight per day of the bird like so i know i've got a flock of chicks out there and i know that they're a day i don't know actually they're they're about 30 grams off of our average right so I'm already, I'm worried about 30 grams. I'm like, well, that's going to turn out to this, that, and the other thing. Like you can do some math, uh, like, you know, harvest weight. If I'm off at 30 grams here and if I maintain that and, you know, you can track your growth curves and compare it to average and, you know, we can predict our harvest weights, you know, two and a half to three weeks ahead of harvest with reasonable accuracy. So, you know, we're already able like, oh, hey, you know, you know, wanted a four pound carcass. Well, crap, we're looking at like 3.6 because it rained a lot, you know. So it's just, I think chickens are great. Don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy all the moving pieces of the puzzle, but you can't drop any of those plates. <laughs> if I can't, that, that was a pretty good mixed metaphor. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm yeah. gonna to walk away from that one right there. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if you've convinced any of us to jump into the business, but um, let's uh, <laughs> definitely like anything, there's some challenges. Let's talk a little bit here as we kind of wrap up. Um, you know, you, I would say that you're striving to be regenerative. What, what things are you seeing from the soil health side, good or bad or different, as you've made the birds more of your center priest enterprise? And right. I, and granted, it's a small footprint, but is that able to spread out over the whole farm? <laughs> kind of, kind of talk yeah. about the regeneration that may or may not be happening there. Right. So uh, there's like five thousand, five different things I'm trying to say all at once right here. So <laughs> uh, first thing is that wait, did I I showed you the compost picture, right? 
where my dad's windrowing the compost. Uh, it, I I'm think not it, sure if we did. And let's go. Let's see. You're looking at the yummy chicken picture again, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. Okay, and come on. Let's go back. Did I skip this picture? Uh, I don't know if you talked about it, but that's right. Okay, so you can. This is where the hoops were, right? You can kind of right. see the the litter that we have. So we got this cool machine out of the conventional industry, and we can take a flat cake and we windrow it up. And then, so then I don't have a picture, but then we've got a manure spreader and we just take that and we spread that on the range. So are you adding moisture to that before you compost it or has it got enough? Nah, it, de it depends on the season. Um, depends on the season. So we can, we have, we figured out ways we basically, because we're next to a lot of um, orchards down in the valley is it's basically orchards. So in fact, our bedding is either almond holes or almond shells or walnut shells. That's what we use for bedding because we basically get it for the cost of trucking it out. And um, then we use just a drip tube with uh, emitters on it if we have to put water on the windrows. But depending on the season, yeah, we can. Uh, the chickens leave a fair a lot, fair amount of water behind. That there is a. It's pounds to pounds, so it's two pounds of water for every pound of feed that they consume. Or it's the other way around. It's two pounds of feed to one pound of water. Anyways, that ratio is the same. So they actually are surprisingly thirsty creatures and they basically poop it all out. So if we're doing a good job with our uh, litter management, we're actually capturing a lot of that water. And our first uh, our first uh, windrow or first uh, blanking on the term turn compost heat, whatever. Usually we don't have to add water to that. Okay. Maybe in the second turn, we'll have to... Uh, add some water, but then we've got these, you know, drip tubes that we just put water out. We've got, I didn't show you a picture. We've got a big old lake on the property. So we, we don't worry too much about water. Luckily. Yeah. So um, that's your composting it in place. And then that goes out to. Yep. Yeah. So, so we, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head. Basically one flock of chickens will provide enough compost for probably four to five acres of rangeland if i'm guesstimating correctly okay. so, and we do you know somewhere between well hopefully we do 26 flocks a year we're probably going to do probably 15 this year something like that 12 15 um so we can get a fair amount of our rangeland covered with our compost there's all sorts of interesting stuff happening with uh, rangeland compost application. There's the Marin Carbon Project has got some stuff going on, right? So we try and hit an area pretty hard. So even though we're only covering 80 acres, we can get a tractor. Because you can kind of tell we're pre pretty hilly. We don't have that much flat stuff. So we mm -hmm. can get a tractor and our compost spreader onto about 1,800 acres of our rangeland. So we just kind of like chunk through 100-ish acres depends on how much compost we make in a year. We just try and chunk through all the best areas. So where the rangeland application of our chicken litter like that, that's crazy. That's just like, you can see a dark green row where the compost went down next huh. to just your native perennial or just your native range. Like, it's just like, boom, just a dark green line. It's awesome. The cows just like sit right on that. It's very apparent. Um, hmm. And we've, we're we're big blue, we're big fans of government money so we got the value added producer grant we've also worked with a healthy soils program here in california which is a i think it's a taxpayer funded situation to do compost application and rangeland cover cropping so we are messing around with uh rangeland cover cropping right now so we'd spread i don't know what do we do probably 80 acres last fall of a whole bunch of different species in different parts of the ranch just to see what happens and that we're we're pretty excited about the thought of well this is just going off all into the fun stuff so i made the joke earlier that i got stuck growing up to be a chicken farmer i really want to be a rancher ranching is way more interesting so in order to fund our <laughs> ranching uh we have to raise these silly chickens but one of the things we've done recently is we um, signed a carbon 
a carbon credit deal with Grassroots Carbon out of Texas. And so <laughs> messing around with the numbers and the, uh, of, um, you know, what you can get out of, okay, here, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm missing your guys' chats. Um, <clears throat> what we do, 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 do. Right. So we're going to make more money sequestering carbon than we will uh, renting out our range, which right. is really kind of an interesting thing. I mean, it's not like a lot of money. It's not like, but it uh, on a kind of percentage basis. And so that really frees us up to be like, well, all of a sudden cows go from being a enterprise where you kind of got to go along to get along. Like everyone ships in around here around Thanksgiving. Everyone ships out around here around May. Like that's, that's just, tradition they come down to the valley for the winter and they go back up to the mountains for the summer but we're thinking realizing like wait a second these cows are really only a tool to help us sequester carbon so that's opening up all sorts of thoughts where we don't need to maximize our cattle our range rent we're actually trying to maximize our carbon sequestration so you know, when you think about it, when we're shipping in now, like we only have a couple, two, three inches of grass and we're warmer than a lot of you, but it's not warm enough to grow grass. So we're basically, my dad calls it the green drought. When we're all like, why it's going to rain, you know, we're just going to pug up our pastures. It's muddy. No one wants to go out and mess with the cows this time of year. Like it's just, but what if we shift our thinking and think about like, Hey, when's the best time to have the cows here? Well, we're thinking that it's this fast growth season from like early March through maybe mid-May, early to mid-May. So what if we change our thinking from like, hey, let's take a a medium number of cows and spread them out over five months. Let's do a lot of cows and have them here for two months, right? We're only here when things are growing. We try and pull off early enough that everything has a chance to recover. We don't have any animals here over the summer. So all of our annuals are up shading the ground. Okay. So that's part of the the thought. And then the other part of the thought is like, hey, we're messing around with this range seeding. What if we get our cover crop in in the fall? Think of it like, you know, a fall wheat crop, right? Whatever. You wouldn't want to graze that off. You know, you you know, everyone talks about turning in stock on six to eight inches of grass. Well, that's what we should be doing with our rangeland cover cropping. So if we wait until March until we bring cows in, sorry, this is my brain going, guys. We bring cows in in March when we've got six to eight inches of growth already and it's about to really take off on us. That's great. We ship the cows out. And if we can get a summer cover crop in of like C4 annuals, if we get sedan grass in or TEF or something like that, there's no cow to impact them on that little tiny, they're just trying to take off. There's no cow coming to hit them. And what if that can grow during the summer along with our native perennials? And we've got all this kind of like good soil biology happening all summer and we're not baking the sa- the ground by, you know, taking our stuff down to the ground. And then when we ship in next March, you know, that is... anyways, brainwaves. Opportunity. Cool. Um, so what do we do to the ground after you move the compost out of the windrow? Uh, We'll come back. We will um, no-till right into where that um, bedding was. One of the other things that we've learned is that there's only so many places in the field for us to place our hoops. And although we don't, we sacrifice it as little as possible. We also just kind of acknowledge that there are some sacrifice spots that we can't do everything perfectly so those that spot where you're looking at or looked at on the tractor like we're gonna put hoops back right on that exact same spot so rather than like kind of you know mildly nuking everything we just like this one spot just gets hammered just it's the way it's a part of the system but that only even though it gets hammered it only gets hammered once every other year or so so this is right after chickens left if you come back now, you would be tough to tell where that spot is. We know where it is. We're going to come right back to it. But from a distance, you can't you can't tell. So, yeah, it's a super high impact, super long recovery kind of uh, situation with the chickens. Cool. Well, good. Yeah, that makes does make sense. Um, well, very good, Tyler. This has been a good discussion. And I hope those of you that are on here live and those that are listening to the recording of that, um, gotten some value from this it's uh it's just neat to learn how regeneration can happen um and really what your context is right whether you're a midwest farmer or 
a Western rancher or a chicken producer in California. Um, you can call me a farmer. I'm willing to take it. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So this is your contact information. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, right here. Tyler Tyler. at bigbluffranch.com. Um, is that a website ad- address? Can we look up that? Oh, yeah. 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 You can go buy some really expensive chicken for me. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to take some of your money. Uh, there you go. Really good chicken. I should, I shouldn't be so negative. It's really, really good. You're actually getting what you're paying for. It's just, it's really expensive too. Um, so yeah, I I love talking about this stuff. Hopefully some of this was cogent and coherent for you guys. I got some brainwaves going. Um, I, I love thinking through these ideas, anything from direct marketing to, um, you know, enterprise, um, stuff. I mean, so if anyone has any interest and needs some help thinking through how chickens might fit into their operations and their context, um, it would be a bit of a stretch to say I'm a consultant, but I am more than happy to talk <laughs> about this sort of stuff. Please have absolutely no hesitation to reach out and we will chat. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's very, very kind of you. Um, those that are listening to the recording, I'd say just go to the bigbluffranch.com. Um, he's got his contact information there and and reach out. And yeah, that's a great resource to have. I mean, even if you're considering uh, multi-species and bringing in birds, right. what an awesome. I mean, there are a lot of factors to consider with producing poultry and I've made all the mistakes. So let me, let me spare you the mistakes. That's, that's, that's the advantage of having a mentor, right? (laughs) Is uh, They help us. So we, we can learn, we can piggyback on their experience and, um, yep. So this uh, recording should be going out on Monday. There would still be time to register for the, um, regenerative legacy summit hopefully all of you have seen the emails uh, i just dumped it in the chat here but the website address is legacy.agsteward.co um, why are we doing this one of the last year we kicked off ag steward we started with a summit and it was called the profitable regeneration summit um, to be regenerative we must be profitable one of the ways to measure success in any business is can it be transferred to the next generation is it a legacy business and a legacy business means that it's not going to die on our watch it's not going to die when we die it's not going to die if we choose or if we're disabled and so to that end we put together a lineup of some amazing speakers to talk about what it takes the nuts and bolts and pieces the principles that will help us to build a business that is truly regenerational. It will last, it will outlast us. Um, I have been blessed to be part of a business that my grandfather started. My father and mother continue to add to it, to refine it. That business looks very different today than it did back then. My grandfather started with sheep. Sheep were the thing that paid for the ranch that we have and, and, and other ranches that family members have that no longer is a center priest enterprise. And so things are going to evolve, but the key principles are still the same. Having good, strong relationships, knowing your numbers, uh, taking good care of the resource base. And even though regenerative wasn't a word back then, my parents and grandparents were regenerative. Their philosophy was to take good care of the livestock and good care of the land and they will take good care of you and that's proven to be true so we hope that you can join us um there will be a replay option if you go ahead even though you're on the email list just um go ahead and sign up and for those that are listening sign up if you're not able to watch all three days it's going to be the 16th 17th and 18th of january from approximately 10 pacific to 4 pacific um it's it's a commitment it's a time commitment the cost is free the value is literally tens of thousands of dollars if you'll go and you'll implement the principles that we share like we have prayerfully carefully um thoughtfully considered who needs to speak what are the messages we need to hear right now we're facing some pretty challenging times in business in general But agriculture business, um, 
even though we're experiencing high commodity prices, there's a lot of people that are feeling the pinch, right? That uh, aren't able to get their operating loans renewed, that are finding out their debt to income ratio is out of whack. And so it's time to make some changes if we are going to be a legacy business. It's time to make some changes for some of us if we're just going to make it through this year. Um, you know, and it wouldn't, no matter where you're at, whether you're starting out, whether you're seasoned, whether you're somewhere in the middle, there will be principles here that we can share with you. So we hope you can join us. And that's uh, that's a mission at Ag Steward is to be able to help you, your family, your farmer and ranchers become profitable, regenerate your land and create a legacy business that can outlast you for generations to come. So with that, Tyler, any parting words, any last things you'd like to share with this audience and the people out there in podcast land? Oh, so much pressure. Um, yeah. Well, th this will be, this will totally sum up our whole discussion and, and encapsulate who I am as a person. So my favorite question to my daughter is what does one plus one equal? It's 11. Thanks. One plus one equals 11. So there you go. Profound thought of the day. If you really want to annoy a preteen daughter, um, prove <laughs> to her that one plus one equals 11. There you go. There you go. I thought you were going to back that up with like it's synergy. And no, anyway, but no, that's no, no, no. Well, then, then this is where the fun part comes from. Then you can like turn it into three or two. This is just, yeah. But yeah, no. Perfect. Well, Tyler, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time. We appreciate the thought and that you put into preparing and the work that you're doing. You know, it's not for the faint hearted and, and you're, you're hard at it. And we appreciate that. So everyone, we hope you can join us again. We're going to have another one in two weeks, second and fourth Thursdays. We do these things live and then uh, you can always check it out on the YouTube or podcast channels at the profitable steward. And uh, we hope you will continue to connect. Thanks, everybody, and take care.